hood, plain 4,500 casualties at Franklin. We know it's about 3,000 more. He set four, four, four or five generals that were uh, wounded, killed. Well, there were, and I'm not saying he's lying at all. I'm just saying that he didn't know all the details yet. But there were six generals killed or more than wounded, eight others wounded, one captured. And he wires Richmond wanting, a, as I noted at Spring Hill, wanting a new lieutenant general. That means to place Cheatham. And as I noted at Spring Hill, the next day he said that General Cheatham has uh, admitted his mistake and he said it would never happen again. So, uh, 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 General Cheatham said that was a mirage. He had a letter of exoneration that four officers repeated verbatim after the war. Yes, three was on his staff, though. I can't remember their names right now. But one was on Hood staff, Cummings. Cummings. And General Hood's headquarters was at Traveler's Rest. Traveler's Rest. From there, from the 2nd until the 14th. And General Hood knew everything that was going on on the federal side. He knew them when they were getting ready to attack. He knew when they didn't attack. And then he knew when they were getting ready to attack on the 15th. Why did he have such good information? Because of people in Nashville that were Southern sympathizers would go through the lines and, and give him information. He knew exactly when the Federals were going to attack. One of them was my great-great-grandfather, Grandpa Turbible. Uh, his, uh, his wife or my great-great-grandmother's brother was killed in the Battle of Franklin. Uh, he had a brother that was in the Confederate Army that was wounded at Nashville and others. He helped build the Maxwell House Hotel. He was a master woodworker and craftsman and carpenter. And that was one of them giving him information, along with others, a lot of other citizens. And on December 2nd, when we get there with more details, D.C. Kelly and at first two guns, bull pups of forest, then four guns will come up to this Cumberland River where the gunboats and transports were moving back and forth and blockaded. And it could not be uh, open until the de morning December 15th. Washington was worried. Lincoln was worried. Grant was worried. Why don't you? Why did you let the Confederates get right on the city where they could see the Capitol? They could hear the, the clocks ringing, the bells ringing. I mean, very very interesting situation. The Confederate forces were reduced to about uh, 21, 22,000 infantry or so. But he sends Palmer's Brigade and uh, Sears Brigade to Murfreesboro as well as Base Division. They came back, Sears and, and Base Division, in time for the Battle of Nashville, and reduced his force plus the food. Now where they get food? A lot of people in Nashville had their relatives in the Confederate Army was getting them food, but still they were suffering terribly. And I read a source from a Georgia that when it was so cold, you could hear them crunching out there, had a blanket, whatever, trying to stay warm. They called it spooning or, or back to back with each other. And then Confederates start singing Bobby Blue Flag and Dixie and whatever through those hills and hillocks during the night, ringing out over the valley. There was an area called Hell's Half Acre, where during this lull, the federal lines so close to the Confederate lines, and they would meet and play poker. I'll show you that area of Sunnyside as a home uh, uh, later in the day. Hood had an off, a defensive offensive plan. <laughs> Get Thomas to attack and counter up with a counterattack. Uh, Napoleon called that deferred suicide. He was hoping Thomas would make a mistake, go out and help to relieve Murfreesboro, 
and he could beat him in detail when he moved out. Thomas never had any plans to go to Murfreesboro, even if they lost it. No one's really heard of Smokey Row on the bus, so I'm not going to go into that right now much later. But it was an area where Brock 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Avenue is today. This front market college and Cherry Street back there. Let's just say it was full of gambling and bars, eight blocks wide, four blocks long of houses for the ill of, uh, how do you say this? The Gilded Lily, Soul Doves, and Wayward Sisters. I think you know what that means, I believe. Your veterans. Yes, but I'll touch more of that later. But it's uh, what one federal officer said is that, uh, uh, let's just put it this way, that we're taking 40% casualties from the women. The Federal Army in 63, 40% casualties from the women. And they had to do something about it, or they were not going to have an army left. Well, no, no. That's what he, that's a documented source. This is not hearsay. And we'll touch more on Smoky Row later. Hijinks of Smoky Row. Even on November 27th, there was gunfire at Smoky Row. They thought Hood made it below Nashville. No, there were two federal regiments, portions thereof, that were shooting at each other because of one of the ladies at Smoky Row. And the lady had her heel shot, uh, didn't hit her foot. <clears throat> we'll touch more of that later. I'm going to give you time to digest this while I'll make sure we don't miss our turn. We have a great, great driver, no way and Rick. We, he's pulling us into our shoe boxes. For those who have been in Chickamauga, T.J. Wood was the one that, uh, and Rosecrans had that problem at the Brotherton Farm. <clears throat> He's now in charge of, of, uh, of that corn now, the largest corn. But both days in the Battle of Nashville, it's like a boxer for Thomas. You, you, you jab with your left, you come over with that right. Jab with your left, come over to the right. This is an extremely hard battle, as Clay knows, to interpret. It's 14 miles wide, and it's a lot of modern stuff now, a ton of it. And so we're going to pick spots. Fort Negley, a wonderful fort open to the public, as well as Bell's Bend, Granberry's Lynette, the Peace Monument, Redoubt Number 1, that's the first day fighting. And then, of course, second day fighting is Peach Orchard Hill, Shias Hill, the Stone Wall. That's private property, but I found a ton of relics will drive by that. Uh, possibly, and I'll talk to I'll talk to General Doug and General Brad about stopping my traveler's rest, Hood's headquarters. Maybe they'll let us walk the rest. Maybe one or two are there. I'm not sure. I'll uh, leave that up to y'all. But we'll stop by there at least and other spots along the way. But we will go into a football stadium on Peach Orchard Hill, Franklin Road Academy, where Ed Barnes says is the best view he had of the of the whole battle, the second day of the Battle of Nashville there. We'll go up there too, and other stops along the way. I did not bring maps, because I'd have to bring 10 maps for each person. That's so wise, you have sectors. And so I'm gonna have to interpret with stories and just basic tactical views here. My friend Steel Wills. I have not read the book, but um, uh, but others say it's the, it's the definitive, definitive work on Thomas. I heard Brad's lecture, and it was excellent last week, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Does any of you have that book on Thomas? Yeah. 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 
Yeah. What, is that? what do you think, Maurice? Yeah, it's really good. Okay. One of the ironies, the title of it, True as Steel, was a description of Thomas by none other than William to come somewhere on the I sure, uh, uh, Maurice brought up a topic, but uh, Billy Sherman said that if I had, if I was to serve under Thomas, I'd gladly do it, and Thomas certainly uh, served under Sherman gladly. Yes, he was his senior to Sherman, but he didn't say one word about it, not one word about it whatsoever. Never made any comment about it. He was a professional, and he did his job. Some try to say that his wife uh, from Troy, Ohio, influenced him to stay with the federal side, union side. I never, uh, I never even considered that. Brad brings up a topic that you know, and he made a joke about it in his lecture that women, no offense for the ladies, but they have a way of suggesting things with it's not telling you ways and blah, 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 blah. But Thomas was a West Pointer, a professional soldier, second U.S. cab, and uh, I don't believe that, you know, for a second. An old Virginia family, uh, and then of course went off to uh, West Point, Mexican War, and when he went, stayed with the Federal Army, his, sister, that his family disowned him. He would send presents to his sisters, birthday presents during the war, and they would send a curt letter back saying, we wish you would change your name. We wish you would change your name. That's heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. Remember that Southampton area of Virginia, an old Virginia family, and uh, that's the way it is. And, uh, it was heartbreaking. His photograph was turned to the wall. It was left that way. General John Bell Hood is living pretty comfortably at Traveler's Rest. Uh, and there's some parties going on there. A wedding went on at the Methodist Church, but had a, a party there for this Major Claire. What was that lady's name? I can't remember right now. Mary Hadley, I think, was her name. Mary Hadley was her name. That a wedding, a wedding was going on about December 8th when it was so cold. Uh, at the Traveler's Rest, Mrs. Overton had a big, big dinner for all these generals. And of course, we're going to go to Nashville. Uh, uh, and they have the autograph books still there. A.P. Stewart was there, Cheatham was there, I believe. Forrest signed the book, Hood signed the book, S.D. Lee, <coughs> among others. Ed Barnes feels that is a very important piece of history, right, uh, that autograph book. It's incredible, all these generals signed it. I'm going to watch really close as we veer off to our right, and I do not want this. might take us a tiny bit of time to get there, find this. I hope I don't get us lost, but we'll find it. If I go the wrong way, when we get off of Charlotte, we can head the other way. This is worth going to. No one on the bus has ever been here. And it is, they, uh, it's about a quarter mile walk, third of a, yeah, about a quarter mile walk when we dismount to get to the river. But it is certainly worth, worth it. has perched our banners is that we made it. We didn't get lost. And wherever you want to park, you know, obviously you're here to the right, going around or whatever, we're going to be walking down that trail to your left over there. I know it was a long drive, uh, a little farther than miles, but a lot quicker than going through Nashville. And why would I take you so far out here? Is we is because of the river, Cumberland River, where four bull pups or parrot guns are going to be blockading this river. Reverend D.C. Kelly, Major, also chaplain for force, and 300 men here, and it started on December 3rd, uh, where they blockade.